The Lord be with you. And also with you. We welcome you to worship today. We're glad you're here. If you're a guest or a newcomer especially, we welcome you. And of course, we welcome all mothers on this your day. So welcome mothers. I'm going to say now, I'm going to invite you to stand. And if you don't know someone, introduce yourself. But if you do know the person next to you, when you shake their hands, tell them your mother's first name. Okay, so stand up and share. While I share some announcements, if you are on the ends of the pews, if you'd grab the friendship pads and begin to pass those and sign those, a couple things you can sign up for as they go by, the uh, baseball game in Kansas City or uh, the Inquirer's Dinner, both coming up. You can read more what that means in the bulletin. After worship today, we invite you all into the gathering space uh, for a special reception for our high school graduates. Make sure you spend a few minutes talking with them, congratulating them, hearing about their future plans. So we congratulate our graduates as well today. And then I'm just going to say some things real quick, and you'll, you can read more about them. But food share, Tuesday at 4.30, packing at the well. Cleanup Saturday, spring cleanup next Saturday, 9 o'clock here. Congregational meeting next Sunday after worship. And it's beginning to be time to sign up for summer Sunday school and even summer sack lunch ministry. And the sign-up sheets are all out there, so we hope that you will look at them. As we've been doing every Sunday during the season of Easter, we again are celebrating the Lord's Supper today. Today we're doing it a little differently in that you will be staying in the pews and we'll be passing the trays and you will be receiving them there. Just a couple things to remember. When they go by, depending on what you're carrying, sometimes it can be helpful to help hold while your neighbor takes out. That can be a little tricky. And then when you get uh, whatever your, your element, just hold them until all have been served and we will partake together. And finally, if gluten is a concern for you when we're uh, passing the bread, there will be an elder moving through the congregation with a bowl of gluten-free bread and just kind of look for that person and signal to them, it's Cheryl, look for Cheryl and she will gladly uh, serve you gluten-free bread. Do you have things you'd like to share, announcements, joys, concerns, prayer concerns? nothing. Well, on Mother's Day, it's become a bit of a tradition. So this is The Lanyard by Billy Collins. The other day, I was ricocheting slowly off the pale walls of this room, bouncing from typewriter to piano, from bookshelf to an envelope lying on the floor. I found myself in the L section of the dictionary where my eyes fell upon the word lanyard. No cookie nibbled by a French novelist could send one more suddenly into the past, a past where I sat at a workbench at a camp by a deep Adirondack lake, learning how to braid thin plastic strips into a lanyard, a gift for my mother. I had never seen anyone use a lanyard or wear one, if that's what you did with them. But that did not keep me from crossing strand over strand again and again until I had made a boxy red and white lanyard for my mother. She gave me life and milk from her breasts, and I gave her a lanyard. She nursed me in many a sick room, lifted teaspoons of medicine to my lips, set cold face cloths on my forehead, and then led me out into the airy light and taught me to walk and swim. 
and I in turn presented her with a lanyard. Here are thousands of meals, she said, and here is clothing and a good education, and here is your lanyard, I replied, which I made with a little help from the counselor. Here is a breathing body and a beating heart, strong legs, bones, and teeth, two clear eyes to read the world, she whispered, and here, I said, is the lanyard I made at camp. And here, I wish to say to her now, is a smaller gift, not the archaic truth that you can never repay your mother, but the rueful admission that when she took the two-tone lanyard from my hands, I was as sure as a boy could be that this useless, worthless thing I wove out of boredom would be enough to make us even. Let us worship God. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who creates the heavens and the earth. Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house, there is plenty of room. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And when everything is complete, I will come for you, so that where I am, you may be also. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia.
Please join me in the prayer of confession printed in the bulletin. Living Lord, you died and were raised and now live forevermore. It is hard for us to live in new ways and new life. Harmful patterns persist. Resentments linger. Hope fades. Love grows weary. Dear seeker of the lost, redeemer of the world, seek us now and find us. Take us out of darkness and put us in your light. Give us eyes of faith and hearts of love that we may be forerunners of your future that even now is already among us. Through Jesus Christ, the Alpha and the Omega, the first, the last, and the living one. Amen. now receive this good news. Can a woman forget her nursing child or have no compassion on the infant of her womb? As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you, says the Lord. Return to me, for you are mine. I have redeemed you. In Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven and we receive everlasting life. In Holy Spirit, we are remade and refreshed. This is the good news. Believe it and live in peace. And as God's forgiven people, hear how we are called to live from Hebrews chapter 13. Let your love for each other hold you together. Welcome strangers with hospitality. Some people, thinking they were welcoming strangers, have entertained angels without realizing it. Remember those who are in prison as if you were in prison with them. Support those who are suffering as though you were the one suffering. Let marriage be held in honor by all, with spouses faithful to one another. Do not be obsessed with getting more and more, but be grateful for what you have. Remember that the Lord has told us, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid.
Amen. Children, will you come and join us up here? Lord be with you. So today is, you all know, I hope, Mother's Day. Have you, have you done special things already? Kind of? Have you, did anybody make breakfast for their mom already? Really? Good. Did you give mom a card? Yes. Have you told her you love her? Yeah. Yeah. And you're still going to do some more special things later in the day? Good, good. Oh, you don't, well, you know, you can still figure it out. You wouldn't be the only one. My dad says Ma Mommy can relax and we have to do all the hard stuff. Well, that's great. Let Mommy relax and you do the hard stuff. All right. And she does the hard stuff 364 days a year, right? Yes. What are you thinking, Jude? I gave my mom a tulip. I gave her a tulip. Well, that's beautiful. You made a tulip. Fantastic. Hey, I have a picture here. You tell me what it is. Do you know? Pelican. It's a bird, but somebody said it was kind it is. Pelican. A pelican. A pelican. Have you ever gone down by the dam and seen the pelicans? Yeah. Yeah, you have? There's a lot of pelicans. And then, you know, I always think it's kind of fun because we're from Pella, so I think we're called pelicans. Is that true? I think it is. I don't know. We can talk about that later. Hey, so that's a pelican, right? Big seabird with a pouch. But what here, I wanted to show you another picture. What is that? That's, no, it's still a pelican. It looks like a swan. The pouch, you can't see as much. But what do you think that is? A pelican. A pelican. With babies. All right. There's an old, old Christian story that mother pelicans... When times were hard and there wasn't maybe enough food to feed their babies, they would go down and they'd prick themselves with their beak until they bled. And their little babies would drink the blood because there was no food. It's a weird story, isn't it? It is. But I think what it's telling us, well, what does it tell us about mother pelicans? They take care of their babies. They care a lot for their babies. They care so much they'd say, this is going to hurt, but I'll do it because I love you. Um, they have to hold on. They have to hold on. Come close to me. Exactly. You, you, you come close to me and I will take care of you. And you know, Christians, when they heard that story, they said, that reminds us of Jesus. That when we are in trouble or hungry or just going through tough times, Jesus says, you come close to me and I'll take care of you. I'll put you under my wing. I'll even feed you and take care of you with my very self. So next time you're down below the dam and you see some pelicans, I have never seen this actually happening below the dam, but you remember this story and you say, mother pelicans love their babies so much they would do that. My mom loves me so much, she would do incredible stuff for me, even if it hurt her. And Jesus loves you so much, he says, you come close, I'll take care of you, I'll even feed you with myself. Let's, let's have a prayer, okay? Dear God, we thank you for mothers. We thank you for all the good stuff they give us, from life to food to laughter to taking care of us. We thank you that mothers say, even if this hurts me, I want to give it to you. We thank you for that kind of love. We thank you that you have that kind of love for us and that you always are saying, when you're hungry or afraid, come close to me and I'll take care of you. 
We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand up. And we're going to be blessed here. But I thought maybe before they talk to you and bless you, you could say something to your moms out there. What do you want to say? Thank you, Mom. I love you, Mom. What do you want to say? What did you vote for? Hello. Oh, we got to do better than hello. <laughs> Let's say thank you. Just not to your mom. Thank you, moms. Make it all moms. One, two, three. Thank you. Okay. Okay, and now congregation, will you bless your children? You are God's beloved child. With you, God is well pleased. Living God, now as we receive your word, we ask that by your Holy Spirit you would soften us, you would open us, you would make us receptive. In these words, may we be challenged, may we be comforted, may we find hope, may we be filled with the living word, Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray, amen. Our scripture lesson today is from Acts 15, verses 1 through 11. Hear the word of the Lord. Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. So they were sent on their way by the church, and as they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported the, con- con- I'm sorry, the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the believers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some believers, who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees, stood up and said, It is necessary for them to be circumcised in order to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders met together to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, My brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of the good news and become believers. And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, 
He has made no distinction between them and us. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither you, your ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. This is the word of the Lord. So do you remember your very first visit to Second Reformed Church? And what were your impressions and your encounters, your anxieties, maybe your fears? I think it was about five or six summers ago, we encouraged each one of you to go out during the summer and visit a different church. Somewhat so you could see how they do it, maybe come back with some good ideas, but mainly so you could have the experience of being new, of being a stranger, and seeing how that felt. And maybe we should do that again. But I do wonder what you thought that first Sunday you walked in here. Were you thinking, will I know anybody? Will anybody talk to me? Will anybody acknowledge me? Maybe you were thinking, I hope I know when to stand up and sit down at the right times. Maybe, will I be dressed appropriately? All kinds of thoughts and anxieties going on in your heads. One thing I am almost certain none of you were worried about. Do they accept Gentiles at this church? You think me being a Gentile, and I assume all or most all of us here are Gentiles, a person who's not Jewish would be welcomed at the church. We take it for granted today, but as our story from the 15th chapter of Acts made clear, that wasn't always the case. As the church began to grow and spread, and as Gentiles were drawn to Christ, there was controversy, there was debate, there was discussion about could Gentiles follow Christ? And as we heard in what we call now the Jerusalem Council, the early leaders of the church got together and debated this and discussed this and listened and waited on the Spirit and came up with an answer. And some said, yes, they can, but they must follow the law of Moses. So they must be circumcised. They must eat kosher only. And fortunately, I'd say, they lost. But others said, and did you hear sort of what they said? They said, why would we want to put on them the yoke that we have had to carry all this time, carried so unsuccessfully? And that's a good question. I find that oftentimes if we've gone through something negative, some sort of odd initiation ritual we hated, we make sure the person after us has to go through that same negative experience as well. But the church said no to that. There is no distinction between us and them. The church has no us and thems, only us. So a huge decision there was made in the church. There is no distinction, or as they ended, they and we will all be saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. That is where our unity and our identity and our hope are found. As I was thinking about this Jerusalem council and meeting and when it was going on, this week I thought, I wonder what my ancestors were doing as that was going on thousands of years ago. Some sort of 
primitive barbarians. I don't know, were they in Europe yet or Central Asia? You know, I have no idea. Mucking around, living primitively, probably worshiping an oak tree or a goat, and never had heard of Jerusalem. Certainly had never heard of Jesus Christ. Yet the decision made that day in Jerusalem, a small little trickle would go out and eventually become a torrent. And I I have really no idea when my people and Jesus Christ intersected, but somewhere along they did. And here I am. And you would have similar stories like that. I also then thought, what about the future? And what, what today is some small thing that's happening maybe in a church in Mumbai or Brasilia that we don't even understand or understand its significance? It's a trickle, but maybe in 50 years or 200 years, it'll be a torrent that sweeps through North America and comes to Pella and changes our church. Who knows? But when we think about monumental events in the life of the church, what comes to mind in all these 20 centuries? Maybe you think of Martin Luther or Martin Luther King, great leaders who changed the church. Or maybe if you're historical, you say, well, what about when the emperor Caesar Constantine became a Christian And Christianity went from being the minority outcast instead to the religion of the powerful and the privileged. Pretty monumental. Maybe you'd say, what about the Council of Nicaea? When the church said Jesus Christ is God of God, light of light, light, very God of very God, big stuff is going on. All those aren't bad answers, but if you asked me, I would say that since Pentecost, Nothing was as monumental, nothing changed the church as much as this Jerusalem council. For it took Christianity and said, we are not some little splinter group of Judaism. We are for all people. We welcome all. We go out and seek all. And all of those barriers and divisions that people have built, the gospel tells us, to take down. I think it was maybe two summers ago, Sophie and I preached all summer through these chapters in Acts, probably from about Acts 8 to here, the culmination in Acts 15. And we went into it in much greater detail. But when I got, we got done, I wrote 10 things I learned preaching through those chapters of Acts. And I'm not going to give you all 10 today but a few of them that I think are worth remembering. First, even though this decision was made on this day in Jerusalem at a council, it took decades, generations, to be fully accepted and implemented. If you read the early letters Paul writes to the church, you see that the Gentile Jew friction, questions, how do we live this out, kept going for decades and generations. And big change in the church is never made because of some simple decision. It takes time. And I think the same would be true of us as individuals. When the Spirit is working on us, I think we often go back and forth. We vacillate. We say, yes, I'm good with that. Well, maybe not. Yes, I am. And that's okay. Peter did this several times on this question about whether the Gentiles could be accepted. So change takes time. We go back and forth. Another thing. Yuck is usually not a good moral compass. What is yucky is not necessarily telling us where the Holy Spirit is leading us. If you go back and look from about chapter 8 to 15 of Acts, might be called an adventure and encounters with yuckiness. First, the church has to go and they meet and engage Samaritans, 
Oh, those mongrel idol worshipers. But Jesus seems to want us to reach out to them. And then, as we heard last week, oh, we're going to have an encounter with an Ethiopian eunuch, this person of odd gender identity, neither A nor B. Ooh, yuck. But this person is baptized. And then Peter, a few chapters later, goes and stays in the house of Simon the Tanner. This person who spends his life with corpses, dead animals, touching them all the time, double yuck on that. And then Peter has this vision while he's at Simon's house telling him to eat pork chops and prawns. If that doesn't gross you out, nothing will. And then finally today, accepting Gentiles, the outsiders, the uncircumcised, the unclean, there is no distinction between us and them. Yuck is not a good indication of where the Spirit is. 19th century missionaries often learned the same things. They would land in some new culture. Look at how these people dress. Look at how they eat. Look at how they structure their society. We'll just have to straighten them out. 10, 5, 15 years in, it makes sense the way they eat, the way they dress the way they structure their society. What I thought was yucky is actually a gift and a wise thing. Another thing, and I'm always a little reluctant to say this, that we see in Acts 15, Scripture doesn't pay, play that large of a role, apparently, in the decision. Instead, they talk a lot about stories they've had. They talk about dreams they've been given by the Holy Spirit. Now, the last thing I want to do is to stand up here and act as if Scripture is not important as we're trying to sense where the Holy Spirit is going. But I think those people in the early church, and we too, need to be people who read Scripture at such a depth and take it so seriously, we know that these important decisions are never faced, ma- fixed with sort of a scripture face-off. I see your verse and I raise you with mine. Instead, that scripture so shapes us that it forms our dreams and our dreams come back to form the way we read scripture. Finally, what happens here in Acts 15 is monumental. Like I say, I might claim it's the biggest thing that's ever happened in the life of the church. Yet I would say it is not history. It's not just something to look back on fondly. It's not a once and done. What it is is a pattern a guide for what the Holy Spirit is continually doing in the church. And when we listen and we are at its best, we continue to do what was done there. Break down walls, reach across barriers, break taboos, open the door wide and say, all are welcome. There is no distinction between us and them for we all will be saved only by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. All will be welcome. And that means that even the son of pagan barbarians from long ago can sometimes even bring the gospel. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. People of God, God has spoken to us, and now God invites us to respond. And we do so today by standing and saying what we believe, today using portions of the Belhar Confession. So let us rise and say what we believe. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who gathers, protects, and cares for the church through word and spirit. This God has done since the beginning of the world and will do to the end. 
We believe that God has entrusted the church with the message of reconciliation in Jesus Christ, that the church is called to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, that the church, by both word and deed, is to point toward the new heaven and the new earth. We believe that God, in a world full of injustice and enmity, is in a special way the God of the destitute, the poor, and the wronged. We believe that God calls the Church to follow in this, for God brings justice to the oppressed and gives bread to the hungry. God supports the downtrodden, protects the stranger, helps orphans and widows, and blocks the path of the ungodly so that justice may roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Jesus is Lord. To the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be honor and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Let us lift up our hearts and minds to God in prayer. Loving God, today we remember, we give thanks for mothers, for our own mothers, for all that we have received from them, for all the tangible, practical things, for all the invisible important things they have also shared with us, for all they have taught us, for all they have poured into us, for their love, for the way they have been role models, for the way they have been role models in faith. We pray today for pregnant mothers. Give them health. We pray today for new mothers. Give them sleep and strength. We pray today for single mothers that they may know your companionship and courage. We pray today for all women who have guided us and blessed us and loved us, for grandmothers and great-grandmothers, for aunts and stepmothers, for mentors, for teachers, for pastors. We give you thanks for all the ways your love has come to us through these women. You know, O oh Lord, that where there is a door and an opportunity for great love, there is always also pain and disappointment. So we also remember those for whom today is a difficult day, for whom their relationship with their mother is not what they had hoped. We pray today for those who are missing their mothers. And even more, we pray for mothers today who are missing their children. We pray for all those who wish they could be mothers and for some reason cannot. And we remember those who have chosen not to be mothers. May they too know that they are included, they are blessed, they are loved, and they have a role to play. Today, be like a warm, loving, healing mother to Carol, to Eric, to the Hinga family. And for whom else shall we pray? Lord, today too, we pray for your church around the world, that you might nurture it, and that we too might continue to be like that church in Acts, reaching out, crossing boundaries, breaking down walls, breaking taboos, finding that there is no distinction between us and them. So, Holy Spirit, continue to stretch us 
to bless us, to lead us into places where we had no intention of going. We offer our prayers today, hopefully, confidently, boldly, because we offer them in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord, and the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus says, to whom much is given, much is asked. Let us bring our offerings to the Lord.
offer our gifts to you, Lord, with grateful, cheerful hearts. We thank you that you provide all that we need when we need it. Trusting you, we can share what we have with others, and we do this joyfully, and we do this together. Accept these gifts and ourselves in your service. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Beloved in the Lord, this holy supper we are about to partake is a feast of remembrance, a feast of communion, and a feast of hope. We come to remember Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection and ascension, by which we are adopted as God's children now and forever. We also come to have communion with this same Christ, who has promised to be with us always, even to the end of the age. In the bread, he comes to us as the heavenly bread that strengthens us to eternal life. And in the cup, he comes to us as the vine in whom we must abide if we are to bear fruit. Finally, we come in hope. For this meal is a pledge, a foretaste of the great feast of love, which we shall all partake when God's kingdom has fully come. And so we invite each of you, all of you, to partake in this meal of Jesus. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God our thanks and praise. It is right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord God, creator and ruler of the universe. You created the fruit of the vine and you bring forth bread from the earth. Blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, whom you sent to free us from sin and death. In humility, he descended from heaven to serve with love. He who is boundless took on the bondage of our sin. The cup of suffering which he drank has become for us the cup of salvation. For all your abundant blessings, we praise you, joining our voices with the faithful on earth and the choirs of heaven to sing. gather at this table to remember the complete and once for all sacrifice offered by our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross for the sin of the whole world. Your death, Lord Jesus, we remember. Your resurrection, we celebrate. Your coming in glory, we await. By your Holy Spirit, may we receive in the bread we break and the cup we bless the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Unite us with all your saints, gathered at this table, at other tables, young and old, seen and unseen, near and far, living and dead, all one in Christ Jesus. As this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf, and these grapes from many hills into one cup, Grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth to feast at your table in glory. Feed our hearts in this meal, that we may follow you faithfully in the days ahead, loving you above all else, loving our neighbors as ourselves, and living in hope until the glorious day when Christ will come again. Even so, Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had blessed it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
bread that we break is the communion of the body of Christ. All of you, eat of it. After they had eaten, Jesus took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. The cup which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. All of you drink of it. Beloved, the Lord has fed us at his life-giving table, so let us offer heartfelt thanks and praise.
The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. God's face is always turned towards you. God's smile is always upon you. So go in peace. Amen.